stories that matter. The journey of life from birth to death is an extraordinary trip, sometimes filled with great joy and excitement, but at other times filled with pain, sorrow, and disappointment. Stories That Matter shares both extremes with you. Sometimes our stories will make you feel very happy, but the journey of life is not all happiness. Other times, the journey of life will make you feel sad, for all of us have experienced both extremes. Stories That Matter will begin right after the break with a story that will touch your heart in the journey of life. Welcome to Stories That Matter. I'm your host, Doug Thompson, with my special guest, Mary Eisenhower. Mary, I thank you so much for being here, taking time out of your schedule to be here. And, uh, and this is a pleasure because uh, I was in the military. I've served in your grandfather's um, honor guard at the time of the funeral. Oh. And, uh, and I saw him as a young kid when I was maybe fourth grader, fifth grader, somewhere along in there, just trying to figure out the year. But I guess it was probably for the groundbreaking of the uh, library. Uh, or maybe it was the museum, I'm not sure which one. It was sometime in the mid-50s, probably, 56. That would have been the library. That would have been the, the library, okay. And uh, he always did a great job of making sure that the little kids got taken care of, so we always had front row spots for anything like that. And I was going to school at Grandview Plaza in Junction. And so I wasn't from uh, any further from me to the, to the main camera that Glenda's at over there, 10 feet, 9 feet, something like that from him, and being on the knees and getting to... Uh, look at him, listen to him, and of course he was from Abilene, and so I knew about him. We all did. And uh, what, what's, what's your recollections about your grandfather and your grandmother? Oh, well, actually, uh, there's so so many. I think uh, the thing that I uh, loved the most about him was I knew he was somebody important, um, and I knew that they had a big fancy house in Washington, but uh, I didn't realize they didn't own it for starters. Right. And um, um, all of that, but I, I never really understood um, because he he would he would come home from the office um, and he would um, completely leave it behind, and he was totally a knee slapping grandfather when he would get into the living quarters of the White House, and you know we'd just have dinner like any other family, and um, you know he uh, did lots of little things there. Um, he had a tremendous belly laugh. It would come from the back of his toe all the way up. Um, and you couldn't help but laugh. If he got really tickled at something, you couldn't help but laugh with him. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And my grandmother was the same way. Both of them were like that. They were very positive and they had great senses of humor. Um, but uh, I think uh, uh, at the end of the day, with all the strangers that he saw and all the, um, you know, he, he never met somebody that wasn't his family, if that makes sense. It does. Uh, I know, for example, um, the night before we deplo uh, deployed for D-Day at Greenham Commons, he was walking around with the troops. And uh, he, he did that, somebody asked him why later, and he said, because I knew that I was sending at least half of them to their death, and yeah. he felt like they had the right to see the man who's doing it. Well, keeping that uh, in mind, uh, there was a fairly famous picture um, of Granddad talking to a troop who was wearing a number 23 around his neck, and they even made a poster stamp out of it. Um, and it, I don't know, Granddad had a copy of that on his desk, and my father had a copy on his desk, so I saw that picture all of my life. Granddad's there, and he's he's looking right at the person, and he's looking very, very intense, and he, he's just like this. And I thought, I wonder what he's saying to him, you know, because I, as as a grandchild, we could do no wrong or anything like that. So you know, he was never intense around us. Um, anyway, so when he would have been a hundred years old in 1990. Um, I met number 23. He was on one of the, uh, he was on the USS Eisenhower where we had a reception uh, in Granddad's honor. And his name was Wally Strobel. He was from Saginaw, Michigan. And I said, oh, Wally, I am so glad to finally meet you. You know, ever since I can remember, I've seen your picture on Granddad's desk, on Daddy's desk. I said, what in the world were you saying yeah. to him? 
And he just kind of smiles and he says, well, he might have been asking me about the fishing in Saginaw. Fly fishing, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I've seen that picture. I know that picture. And I know, I know that sequence that you're talking about because we did one of the stories that matter we did here uh, was Dick Seitz. And he was in the 101st Airborne. He was the commanding officer of mm -hmm. it. And I know that later that I, uh, I'd heard him on one of the videos say that one of the toughest things I ever had to do was talking to the paratroopers. And because I was sending the best that this country has to certain death by launching them behind the, behind the lines. And uh, boy, if, if, you, if you have to be in combat, you want to serve for somebody, somebody like that that appreciates you, appreciates the effort. And, um, and understands it because he certainly uh, not only talked the talk, but he walked it. Yeah. He'd been in the military and he'd been in all kinds of settings and tough situations. And uh, it's nice to know that as you say, well, when we would get back into the family quarters, he was just Papa. That's, and you know, she was just Nana. And they just grab us and hug us and tickle and, and just like anybody else. And, uh, He's a niece, awesome. life and grandfather. <laughs> yeah, just like it. We're gonna cut away, take a break. You're watching Stories That Matter. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Stories That Matter. I'm your host, Doug Thompson, with my special guest, Mary Eisenhower. And if you don't know who Mary is, I don't know why you wouldn't, but her grandparents were uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, the President of the United States, and Mamie Eisenhower. And you can't go into a restaurant in Abilene and not see uh, pictures of them on the wall. That's got to be fun for you to go in and say, oh, I remember that. I remember when this happened. Yeah. Actually, uh, that does happen. Yeah, I'm sometimes. sure it does. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. it does anywhere in Abilene. And uh, it's, you know, of course, many of the people now have moved on through in their journey in life. But uh, over the years, many would say, well, I knew him. I knew him when, and I knew this. And uh, he used to deliver ice to me when he was a, a young kid. And I knew their family where they lived and so forth. But uh, you, um, you had picked up a baton from Ike that, because he had started a program called People to People. Yes. What's that mean? Well, um, it, it, it boils down to it's a grassroots movement, people to people. Um, and it was his way, uh, he founded it uh, on September 11th, 1956, uh, as a way to peaceably combat the Cold War. Um, and he thought that if uh, the people from around the world, you know, did cr cross-cultural uh, projects, um, things that would uh, would not require speaking the same language, you know, for example, um, medical projects, food projects, um, um, cultural projects where, you know, you would learn to understand each other and all that, that um, uh, the hope was that at the grassroots level there, there would be a tolerance or uh, an understanding or even um, a friendship that would evolve from it that uh, eventually the governments would have to reflect how the people felt. And um, he said, uh, the people want peace. Indeed, uh, the people want peace so badly that the governments are going to have to step aside and let them yeah. have it. Yeah. So he just felt like uh, we could do it far more effectively than the government. So it was a situation then where it wasn't government to government or it wasn't uh, restricted by boundaries. It was just people. If you developed a relationship or wanted to develop a relationship with somebody, you could, you could break down those barriers of the borders and just have that relationship of being able to say, what are your needs? How can I help? How can you help us? And people to people, just like it sounds. Yes, exactly. Okay. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it, you know, to me, I, I, I headed people to people for over 20 years, um, and now my son heads it, but um, um, during that time, it's, it's almost like the things that we did, I knew were making a big difference, but we were having so much fun, we didn't, you know, it didn't feel like work. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It yeah. does make sense. And fun, fun in all capacities. And I remember reading a story about, uh, I think it was maybe uh, Khrushchev's son. Yes. That, t t tell me about that. Well, um, it was kind of interesting, uh, if you want to go way back, um, when I was a girl, um, you know, of course, Nikita Khrushchev came to the United States. Right. And my grandfather um, would bring heads of states to his farm in Abilene. Um, I'm sorry, not Abilene, Gettysburg, right. I'm Freudian because I just right. moved there. Um, uh, so that they could see something other than D.C. or New York or Chicago as, as part of the United States. 
And uh, amongst his visitors were like de Gaulle, um, Churchill, and Nikita Khrushchev. And um, as early as 1954, Khrushchev and him had actually um, devised a citizen ambassador program similar to People to People, and it became a program of People to People later, um, where they sent 25 U.S. businessmen to the uh, Soviet Union to meet their counterparts. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and um, they wouldn't allow any women. It was all men, uh, businessmen. But um, yeah, that started a lot of exchanges, uh, and it was kind of the, the the birth of the People to People program, but it didn't really come to fruition until 56. But anyway, in 58, um, Khrushchev did come to the farm, and uh, of course, uh, he came bearing gifts for the for the kids. He gave my brother a Kennedy coloring book. Is that right? <laughs> kind of okay. Well, whatever. <laughs> and he gave the girls. Uh, there's three girls. Um, uh, Russian nesting dolls. Oh. And we were we were told we needed to stay in the living room, which we were rarely allowed in. Um, and he and Granddad went to the the porch, which is where we flopped. You know, the glassed in porch that they had. And they walked out kind of arm in arm, and um, then um, Granddad came back in, and Khrushchev was kind of behind him, uh, and he was about the color of your sweater. And I'd never seen him angry before. We couldn't do anything wrong. We were his grandchildren, you know. You mean I? He was. Oh, he red. was mad. Yeah, he was mad. And he grabbed all those gifts up, and you know, gave them back to uh, Khrushchev. And we put up such a fuss, he let us keep the gifts. But um, I still have them, by the way, my nest dolls. Um, but you know, it really frightened me. And, and one of the things that uh, he had given us too were Soviet lapel pins that we uh, put in our little lapels. Okay. And I don't think Granddad even noticed those when he was, you know. He'd have pulled them off in a heartbeat, wouldn't he? Yeah, so <laughs> on the way home, uh, my parents are talking about what happened on the porch. You know, and, um, my mother out of the corner of her eye saw my lapel pin and she sticks her hand out like that. Now give it to me now. All four of us had to give up our lapel pins and she threw them out into a cow pasture. So if there's ever an archaeological dig in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Then if you fast forward to 1996, which, you know, that was quite a while later, the People to People organization had contacted me to, um, they were asking me to be a keynote speaker at their worldwide conference. They said they wanted to know about the heart and soul of People to People. And I thought, well, you know, I'd been busy raising kids and things like that. I uh, hadn't been very involved as an adult. And, uh, but I remembered many times my father and grandfather talking about it, at, you know, taking it private at the uh, dinner table or even around the porch or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, Granddad was really, I mean, he was avid about the whole thing. He, he really believed that that would work. And he wanted and to carry it on after his presidency, second he term. Did, ended, so. And he wanted to be able to do something with people to people, uh, but no longer being the president. Right. So he, he said, if it if it you know if it doesn't belong to the people, uh, it's never going to work as a government agency. Right. He he really felt that way. So he um, engaged his good friend, J. C. Hall, uh, in um, Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, asked Hall for help, uh, funding help, and Hall agreed. But he said he didn't do anything outside of Kansas City. So that's how People to People ended up. Oh. The world headquarters. That's in Kansas how the headquarters City. are in Kansas City. So well, anyway, I, I felt like you know, I, I can sure I can I can I can do, give the talk or whatever. And the night before I was supposed to speak, um, one of the trustees grabbed me by the arm and she said, "Mary Jean, there's somebody here you have to meet." And I saw him from a distance. And my heart fell to my feet because he looked just like his father. It was Sergei Khrushchev. And I thought, what is an organization like People to People that Granddad chairs so much doing, put me, putting me with somebody like him? But then, of course, Mimi always taught me to be very, uh, you know. Cordial. Yeah, manners, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So I put my hand out, um, and I was kind of reluctantly meeting him. And he pulled me close to him when I put my hand out, and he said, my dear, I hope you're not as uncomfortable as I am, which totally broke the ice. I just cracked up, and um, 45 minutes later, I walked away thinking I'd met one of the nicest human beings I'd ever met, and then I thought, that's what people to people does, and yeah. that's why they put me with somebody like him. And uh, it was kind of interesting because uh, later on, you know how life is kind of a circle. Right. Uh, I... Uh, 
was in Marshfield, Missouri, and uh, one of the organizers of that particular event asked me if I would be willing to interview him, and I had not seen him in 21 years since he com completely changed my life, is what yeah. he did, because wow. I went back that Monday and quit my job at the engineering firm and um, went and to work for people, people to people, people. yeah. yeah. Um, and anyway, uh, I said, yeah, that'll give me a chance to, to tell him, you know, you actually turned my life, my own, my life around. But anyway, um, so we met before I interviewed him and uh, I said, is there anything you want me to, you know, because uh, Russian relations, shall we say, were like a very high topic in the news at that particular moment. He says, oh no, I'll answer anything. You know, he, he, he seemed like he was okay with that. And I said, okay. And I, then I told him the story. I said, you know, you changed my life, you know, 180 degrees. Um, he remembered the meeting, didn't he? He did. Yeah. He did. And he said, whoa, that's very flattering. And I said, well, do you mind if I share it with the audience? And he said, um, he said, no, that would be all right. And I said, okay, good. You know, because I wanted to give him a globe and all that stuff. Yeah. And I said, you know, I have to admit, it's kind of funny now, but I, I wonder what you were doing at the people to people meeting to begin with. And um, he said, well, it's very disturbing to hear buried alive when you're a little girl. And I thought, now, how did he know that? I don't tell anybody what was said out there. You know, uh, I'm sure there was something in the language. Uh, you know, I uh -huh. kind of hesitate to even say what it was, but um, I thought, now, how did he know that? Because, you know, that's something I never, when I tell that story, never right. say. So we're, we went back to, we were staying at the same bed and breakfast, and uh, he, he's 80 something, and he went up to take his nap, and um, I, there, there was a book on the coffee table, obviously the owner of the bed and breakfast had bought because he was staying there. It's Khrushchev on Khrushchev, and I thought, oh, this is interesting. And I turned it over, and there was a picture of a young Sergei Khrushchev with his father. And I about fainted when I saw it because that was an unidentified, in my mind, man who was with him at the farm. He was out there. He heard what, oh. and that's how he knew what I, you know, and I guess his way, the, the comments that he had made to me were his way of apologizing. Oh. Well, that is interesting. He's, he's a super nice person. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. What a good experience you've had. What a fantastic lifetime you've had. <laughs> we're going to cut away. You're watching Stories That Matter. Welcome back to Stories That Matter. I'm your host, Doug Thompson, with my special guest, Mary Eisenhower, and that would be uh, Dwight Eisenhower's granddaughter, and of course, Mamie's too. And hmm. we've been talking about some of these stories, and I wish, the, I wish the people who are watching the show could hear some of the stories we've talked about as we walked around the, the studio facility here, because they are amazing stories. We could go on for hours talking about them. What an amazing life that you've lived, the opportunity to be in that setting and to be, like you said at the beginning, well, I was just like the granddaughter, you know, so it was, uh, uh, you know, it was just, just my papa and my nana. That's what they were to me. And I didn't understand the big white house that it wasn't theirs. It was the White House belonged to the people. And so let's shift gears a little bit because uh, Eisenhower, um, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, certainly uh, came from an amazing family. And uh, his mother's name was Ida. Ida. And uh, you're doing some research right now for the possibility of writing a book about Ida. Yes. And her husband's name, of course, was uh, David. Yes. And David was from Pennsylvania. And where was Ida from originally? Ida was from um, the Stanton, Virginia area in Mount Sydney, Virginia. And she had an amazing, amazing life story. Yes, yeah, she did. Yeah. She did. She was, uh, she was a, a very brave woman. She uh, um, got herself uh, across country uh, to be with her brother uh, at age 21 in and the mid 1800s. Her parents died real early, didn't they? Her parents her died. Her, her mom died when uh, she was five, and her dad died when she was nine. Oh. And um, she managed to get herself through school and um, get out to Kansas and got herself enrolled in college, and um, met my great grandfather there. And they started a little general store in Hope, Kansas, and that's where two of my uncles were born. And uh, my grandfather uh, just after them in Denison, Texas. Wow. So wow. She, uh, she, I think she, you know, as, as a mother and grandmother myself, um, I think she was a saint just to get 
six boys raised. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. would be tremendous. I, yeah. I, I, I can say this because it doesn't matter now, but I can't imagine her level of disappointment to have six boys and no girls in the mix with all of that. Surely she would have expressed some frustration over that later. Having six kids, what would be the odds of all of them being boys? She would loved every one of them, I know, but did she ever say? She did. <laughs> you, you don't know. Well, maybe. Uh, it manifested, but never verbally. She okay. she was uh, very uh, um, protective of her sons, and there was a Victorian tradition that she exercised on one son. And you know, at the Eisenhower Library, they'll say it was you know it was a, it was a custom, a Victorian custom. And she was not Victorian, and it was only one son, but it was her youngest, Milton, that she dressed in curls and dresses till he was five years old. <laughs> now the upside. <laughs> The upside, you know, you can imagine the rest of the boys with all that testosterone going on around the farm and things like that. It was like, oh my, you know, yeah. oh the baby, the sissy, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but he did make the best best dressed um, uh, list, something like ten years in a row really? later on in in adult life. Yeah, so uh, you know, apparently it had some influence on. Wasn't him. traumatized by it at all. Huh? Right, right. <laughs> he seemed to be comfortable <laughs> with it. But um, uh, yeah, she uh, she did that. But uh, I thought the the best testament to how she was, how she felt about her boys was um, in 19, I believe it was 47, maybe 45, it was right at the end of the war. Mm. Uh, she was elected uh, Kansas Mother of the Year. And uh, of course, reporters came out to the little house in Abilene and talked to her and said, what do you think about your remarkable son? And she said, which one? Which one? Yeah. 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 That's what moms that's would good, do. That's a good because mom. Because every one of her sons were remarkable to her, and they were, and uh, and that's fantastic. That's, that speaks volumes. You know, as I was saying before we went on the air, I was talking about when I was a young kid, and I went there to the house um, while it was part of the museum, of course, and. Uh, I was so impressed with the Bible, and um, when I just looked at it, because I had a mom who influenced me that way too, and and I could just see that the influence from her upon those kids was just absolutely tremendous. Because that that just does not happen. It does not happen without a parent being uh, really invested, or parents being invested in those kids, and to get the eternal. Um, groundwork that needs to be laid because we're all just moving through in a journey called life and then at the other end is going to be when it all begins and she was so strong do you remember do you did you hear that about her and in your research oh. about her that that uh, she was so strong in her faith oh absolutely she um, uh, at one point when she was still in Virginia there was a controversy about whether or not she should continue school because you know ladies didn't need education in those days and she felt like she did and um, so um, she uh, she ended up um, having to, to work to support herself to get through high school because the relatives she was living with. Um, yeah, her parents were already gone. Her they parents were, were already gone and the relatives that she didn't think it was necessary for her to get an education and she, she totally, uh, and she also imposed that um, philosophy, the, the education being everything philosophy on her boys and that's one of the reasons a lot of them were all successes, but she was um, an extreme pacifist. She was River Brethren uh, until she, um, actually she was uh, Lutheran until she met David and then she became R River Brethren uh, with him. But um, uh, when my grandfather, um, well, my grandfather and his brother um, Edgar had a, um, a deal that they would work and put each other through school. Oh, I heard that. Right, and uh, Edgar, you know, got through school, and then he was just getting settled into his career, and really couldn't kind of provide the same for Granddad. So, Granddad applied to the U.S. Uh, Naval Academy mm -hmm. um, for uh, to, you know, try to get for the free education. Mm -hmm. And of course, he was too old because he'd worked uh, too long uh, trying to get Edgar through school. He was 21, and uh, then he turned around and applied for West Point and um, was accepted. Thank God. Yeah, I mean, all these little things that would have changed oh, yeah. history. Yeah. And uh, it was interesting because, you know, of course, everybody was very concerned about what his mother would think with him going into a military college. And um, she declined to stand in his way. She was, you know, not happy about it. But she said, the Lord deals you your cards, how you play them is up to you. Yeah. And so she, um, you know, but one of the things I started to uh, talk about too when, um, you know, with the, the whole school thing, um, in order to prove to her um, 
grandfather who she was living with after his, after her parents died that she was worthy of staying in school. She memorized 1,700 Bible verses. I remember verses. you telling me that. That's tremendous because One she each would, occasion of life. Oh, I mean, she, she always had a Bible verse. She always recall those, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, we're going to, matter of fact, this is the end of the show. I hope you've <laughs> enjoyed watching and listening to uh, Mary Eisenhower with Stories That Matter. It's been a great show, and uh, see you next time.